the bells are back for the first time in two years our bell choir has performed live in a service and not through the magic of recording and video editing but real and together and live which is amazing <laughs> even to a mostly empty room because not many of us braved the snow today Many of us are wisely on Zoom today or catching the service on YouTube. For me, the 13th of March is now the anniversary of the last normal day, the last day before the pandemic, the last day before things shut down, before everything was canceled, before Zoom became a way of life. And so it is especially amazing to have music created in real time happen on this day. Music that is made better because people are together in the same space with their masks, with their vaccinations, with all of the things we're doing to keep each other safe. But we can do things together that we cannot do alone. And this is a day to remember and celebrate that. So come let us gather. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. Whether you are uh, here on uh, in person um, or you're on Zoom, um, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, I'm uh, Chris Mesroge. I'm a Sunday service leader. And uh, I also was very touched by the music and very, very much like uh, had a pull in my heart of wanting to, um, you know, wanting to have potlucks again in church and wanting to be able to, uh, you know, uh, to, to talk to everybody and be able to kind of do some of the things that were so nourishing to all of us about church before. And I think, you know, as I often tell, I, I teach, and as I often tell my children, it almost doesn't matter how fast you're going, it matters the direction that you're going. And so uh, with that, um, just welcome everybody and welcome for the direction that we're going. As we begin today, I have a few announcements. The first is that Chalice circles are open for new signups. So Chalice circles are our small group ministry program. It's a circle of people, a small circle that meets once a month. And it, especially in this time, it has been such a source of support and connection and deepening in friendship and deepening in spirituality. That if that appeals to you, I, I encourage you to sign up. Most of our groups are meeting on Zoom right now with hopes that we can be outside as the weather warms. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet at the check-in table here in the building or be in touch with Diane Melvin, our religious educator. And as we begin, I want to take a moment and just let us all greet one another in the best way that we can. So if you are here in the space, which, which way are we going first? tech folks. Okay, so Zoom people, you are invited to turn on your camera if you like and give a big wave to the people here in the room. We're so glad you're with us. We're so glad you did not have to brave these roads. It is good to see you. Look at all those faces. Okay, and now people who are in the room, our cameras are right back there. So I invite you to turn yourself around as you're able and give a big wave to our, <laughs> to our friends who are with us through the magic of technology this morning. It is weird and it is good to be together and all the ways we have to do that now.
From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we Today, our chalice letting words come from Adet Fulbright Olson. This light we kindle is set in the lamp of our history. We inherit this free faith from the brave and gentle, fierce and outspoken hearts and minds that have come before us. Let us be worthy inheritors of this faith and through our good works, pass it boldly to a new generation. This morning, we have chalices lit in Westwood and Munson Lake and Portage, Hartwell, Georgia. We are together. Over the last several months, we've had a series of services on the four faiths, on the different belief systems that we have in our congregation. And we have a trailing reflection that could have been last week if logistics and timing had worked out differently. So now I share with you a reflection from Bill Fox, who is one of the theists in our church. Whenever you're ready. Hello, this is William Fox. I've been here at People's Church for over 10 years. Uh, this is about my religious beliefs. Uh, the first thing I remember is growing up on Warrant Street with my mom and dad and my oldest brother living with my grandfather, a grandmother, and my uncle Don and his daughter, Sharon, who was my cousin. Um, I remember playing in the attic and uh, in the basement, mainly. It was a big house. I know I liked running around a lot. I was pretty hyper. <laughs> uh, then we moved on Lake Street, where I mainly grew up, period, through my adult life with my mom and dad and my older brother, and in time, my younger brother, who was born there, born in living in that house. Um, I grew up believing in spiritualism, believing in life after death. Um, the most thing I do believe that it is a higher being rather than being God or Jesus, or just the higher being. Um, I do believe in what the Bible says in its teaching, mentioning a spiritualist and ghost and telling of fine objects in its teaching. Um, I do believe you can communicate with God through meditation and uh, being in his guidance and the right path through life. This is what I believe. Um, 
in the mid-60s, I met some friends in school that took me to a uh, Bethel Baptist Church here in Kalamazoo, where I was taught how to read the Bible and everything. I pretty much remember everything I was taught in the Bible, but now I don't. <laughs> I kind of forgot about God at all, but yeah, that's, I guess that's just too bad, but that's the way it went. Uh, I did meet a Mr. Smith there, who was my Sunday school teacher. He eventually saved me, which was a repertoire experience for me to remember. Uh, then uh, the preachers there at that church tried to, they came to my house and tried to convert the whole family. But my mother told him almost right away that she didn't believe in their religion. She was a spiritualist. And of course, that scared him off. <laughs> uh, they never came back again. <laughs> in the mid-60s, uh, by 1968, um, we went on vacation down in Indiana, in Indianapolis to be exact, to see my grandfather and my aunt and uncle, who was Uncle Wes and Aunt Essie and Blue, who were both blind. And Wes was a known uh, medium at that time, which he belonged to a spiritualist camp in Chesterfield. Uh, but during that week, we had several seances. It was scary at first, but it was interesting. But the, after staying over the first night, me and my brother Ron, we slept in the spiritualist room where the seances were. But we, they had a fold out couch. We stayed there in that room. And during the night, I woke up and seen this uh, materialization uh, with a cloud around her. Uh, it was my grandmother. She didn't say anything, but it was a strange experience. I was scared, of course. <laughs> uh, she slightly smiled. Uh, I was still scared and I just turned over and put the blanket over my head and went to sleep. It didn't even wake up my brother who I was sleeping with. But I didn't want to wake him up either. <laughs> but I know it was my grandmother because my grandfather had a picture of her in his room. I told the, the, my experiences the next morning to my grandfather and, and Aunt, Aunt Essie and Uncle Wes, and uh, I found out my mom had a similar experience, but maybe more realistic. Uh, he actually, my uh, grandmother actually came in her where she was sleeping in the living room and held her and she could feel her arms around her but she, she was she knew what my mom was going through at that time with my mom husband with my father had an alcoholic problem with alcoholics so she was trying to comfort her But uh, in years to come, she finally divorced him, and uh, she married somebody else, which worked out the probably better. I'm also a firm believer in our UFOs. I've seen most of them here in Kalamazoo County 
through the years. I've never been anywhere else that I haven't seen him except here. And I've seen quite a few where I'm living now in Ashtimo. Mm. Um, I do believe they, they are here to keep an eye on our progress and uh, they believe and, and they're trying to keep humanity from destroying themselves with either pollutants or nuclear energy and nuclear warheads even. Uh, I believe they're here to help us and try to keep this planet beautiful and gluten free. I believe that's all I have to say. <laughs>
This is our youth office area. And let's go explore our gymnasium. As you can see, this is a full court gymnasium for not just our youth, but anyone in the city of Kalamazoo who wishes to utilize it. Concession stand area. And now to the rear of our building where one of our tenants, loaves and fishes, you can only enter them through the rear area. Lowe's and Fishes serves the community every Tuesday and Thursday. As you can see, it's a little quiet here right now, but soon once the library opens and our other organizations come in, it will be busy. The Douglas Community Association has served the community for over 100 years and we organically grow into whatever the community needs. Thank you for visiting the Douglas. Please join me in reading 
for the thanks for all that sustains us. From the countless gifts we each have been given, gifts of life and love and sustenance, we bring these small portions to share in the works of love, which none of us can accomplish alone. People's Church is a caring community. And one of the ways that we care for each other is by taking time during our service to lift up the joys and sorrows and milestones in our lives. So if you have something you wish to share with our gathered community today, I invite you to do so. If you are on Zoom, that means typing it into our chat box and I will read it aloud. If you are here in the comments today, you are invited to come forward, place a stone in our bowl of water. And if you would like to share what you're placing a stone for, you can speak briefly and share your name with the microphone or write it down and I can read it aloud. We will pause our recording now. So this is just shared live in this moment and not with the world forever. Hello, I invite you to join with me in meditation today. Breathing in, I know I am breathing in and breathing out. I know I am breathing out. Breathing in, my breath grows deep and breathing out, my breath grows slow. Breathing in, I dwell in the present moment and breathing out, I know that this is a wonderful moment. I invite you to take a moment to just notice how you are feeling right now in your body. in your heart, in your mind, and in your spirit. With curiosity and with compassion, just honor and acknowledge whatever is present for you right now. And as you hold that true, I invite you to take a moment to ponder, how do you return to your truest self, your best self? Do you have conscious intentions that orient you in your life? What intentions or aspirations do or could 
you set each morning as you begin each day anew. Daily practices can serve to continually reorient us back to our truest selves, to living out our highest ideals and aspirations of how we wish to be each day. Which practices, what practices do you have that ground you? To reorient you back to yourself. As we take three deep breaths, I invite you to just take a moment to contemplate grounding practices and conscious intention setting. As we each listen within to our inner compass, may we follow its course in living towards our highest ideals. As we begin anew each morning, may our lives embody our deepest held values. With open hearts and open minds, may we bring forth more loving kindness, goodness, and justice into this world. May it be so, and blessed be. As we gather together this morning, as we gather together this morning, may we learn to recognize and affirm the pieces of possibility, the bits of good we bring. May we encourage rather than control, love rather than possess, enable rather than envy. Allowing our individual gifts to weave a patchwork for peace, the soft, deep blue of sensitivity and understanding, the red energy of creativity, the white heat of convictions, the risky, fragile green of new growth, the golden flashes of gratitude, the warm rose of love. Each of us is indispensable 
if we are to minister to a broken and wounded world. Together in our gathered diversity, we form a whole. So be it. When giving is all we have. One river gives its journey to the next. We give because someone gave to us. We give because nobody gave to us. We give because giving has changed us. We give because giving could have changed us. We have been better for it. We have been wounded by it. Giving has many faces. It is loud and quiet, big, though small, diamond in wood nails. Its story is old, the plot worn, and the pages too, but we read this book anyway, over and again. Giving is, first and every time, hand to hand, mine to yours, yours to mine. You gave me blue, I gave you yellow. Together, we are simple green. You gave me what you did not have. I gave you what I had to give. Together, we made something greater from the difference. Our third reading is November 22nd by Parker Palmer. On this day, long years ago, our promising young president was killed. He was far too young to die and I too young to watch my world unravel as it did. I grieved my loss, our loss, then started to reweave a work, a life, a world, not knowing then what I know now. The world unravels always, and it must be rewoven time and time again. You must keep collecting threads, threads of meaning, threads of hope, threads of purpose, energy, and will, along with all the knowledge skill that every weaver needs. You must keep on weaving, stopping sometimes only to repair your broken loom, weave a cloak of warmth and light against the dark and cold, a cloak in which to wrap whoever comes to you in need, the world with all its suffering, those near at hand, yourself. And if you are lucky, you will find along the way the thread with which you can weave your, re -weave your own tattered life, the thread that more than any other laces us with warmth and light, making both the weaver and the weaving true, the red thread they call love, the thread you hold and hand along, saying to another, you.
This morning, we started a collective art project. With the guidance of Gay Walker and Corey Zahn, we started weaving thread and ribbon and wire and anything long and bendy onto bicycle wheels. It's by the information desk if you're here in person. And I invite you when the service ends to weave a strand or two. And if, and it will be out all week. So if it is safer or more convenient for you to come on a Tuesday afternoon rather than a Sunday morning, please do that. If you want to have things dropped off or picked up or sent, or you just want know what word you want written on a ribbon, tell me and we will weave it together. You can see already there are different colors and textures. There are words like beauty and nature and life and joy and trans rights woven into this wheel, this wheel of community. The world unravels always, and it must be rewoven time and time again. The world unravels always, and it must be rewoven time and time again. You don't need me to tell you that so much of the past two years has been an unraveling. The unraveling that is nearly a million deaths from COVID-19 in our country, just our country. The unraveling that comes with isolation, the unraveling of our sense of trust in one another and connection and support to the wider world. Our sense of ease has unraveled. The way we used to go in the world without calculating risk or every choice. The unraveling of comfort and confidence, a sense of safety, the ability to plan and have those plans happen. And some things that needed unraveling are starting to unravel. Systems of supremacy and exploitation have been challenged. Ways of doing things questioned and reimagined. We are in the middle of a great unraveling. And there's been unraveling in our church community in these years. Some are less connected. Our programs, our worship, our everything has changed. And for some that has increased access and for some it has increased a sense of distance. And for many, it's just profoundly strange to do church on Zoom or to do church in masks, to not have the potlucks that Chris named that we loved so much. We aren't who we were before. It might not ever be the same as it was before, because even if externally it seemed the same, we are now different than who we were. The world unravels always and must be rewoven again and again. And we are reweaving again and again on these wheels but in the less literal sense as well. We are combining our wisdom, our talents, and reimagining what we have done and doing it in two ways, in new ways over these past two years. We are weaving on wheels to remind us how we are always moving. And we have done things over the past few years that I would have never thought po possible if circumstances hadn't forced us into tremendous creativity and change. We all learned a new way to be the people's church. We moved on to Zoom for Sunday services and religious education, for story times, for meetings, for karaoke nights, for chalice circles. We have made so much use of our church grounds, these precious acres here. I officiated several tiny, tiny outdoor weddings here, including one a year ago, February, where we were knee deep in snow and the pen 
the ink pen that we were trying to sign the marriage license with froze. Nobody would have picked that. And it was okay. And it's a great story now. And we held outdoor worship services and outdoor memorial services. Your leadership and you all invested money and time to turn our outdoor spaces into more hospitable meeting spaces and outdoor classrooms. That is the envy of all of the UU congregations I talk to, our beautiful grounds that we can gather on safely or more safely now. Last fall, we transformed this room into a furniture and bedding and kitchen items storage facility. And it was amazing. This room was packed and strangers just kept showing up with stuff to give to our newest Afghan neighbors. It was amazing and something that we couldn't have done if we needed it cleaned out by the next Sunday for church. And people's people are continuing that work, partnering with our friends at Temple B'nai Israel and Congregation of Moses to help so many, I don't even know how many Afghans at this point, Afghan families resettle and establish a life here. We have learned a lot in these years about how to offer support and connection to one another when it's unsafe to be in the same place. Cards and car parades, so many phone calls and so many Zoom meetings. It is not the same and it might not be as good and we are figuring it out. We have learned how to smile through masks and how to sing through masks outside still only. How to navigate consent and risk and trust in powerful new ways as we are teaching our children about those concepts in the Our Whole Lives Comprehensive Sexuality Education Program, even now. Today, Our Whole Lives is happening for three different age groups in our church. Our kids are learning and we are enabling that to happen. We have grieved and given and grown. We have welcomed new people and we have said, tearful goodbyes to people, to ways of doing things, to our own sense of being in control in the world. It is hard, it is beautiful, and we have been unraveling and reweaving all at once. So as we reweave, as we are together in the same place more and more, returning who we were. We are creating something new, a new people's church for this moment. We are learning new things about ourselves, each other, and how to be community together. We have tried so many things over these years. Some of them have not worked at all, and some we will carry with us and might become part of our practice such as having a water service outside, just kind of makes sense, right? I never would have imagined. We are becoming one community online and in person. And we are one, even though we are not together as we once were, with the ease that we once had. This year, your board set several goals for itself and by extension for all of us. One is to practice difficult conversations in healthy and productive ways. And our church community is a good place, maybe one of the best places to practice this. This has happened some in our series of services on the four faiths. We have heard people's people tell the truth about what they believe, and we have listened to understand. It has been rich. And this process of theological exploration and conversation will continue in a few months as Diane and I prepare a coming of age class for adults. 
We ask our youth to think deeply about what they believe and then prepare faith statements. I'm hoping our grown-ups can follow their lead. Diane and I are taking a class right now on adult faith formation, and we have so many ideas. Stay tuned. As a church, we are also having difficult conversations in healthy and productive ways about the new bylaws that the church voted on two weeks ago. It wasn't an easy process, easy conversations, or an easy congregational meeting. And it's not done. Your board and I are inviting more conversation over the next months to better understand each other's views, figure out what it might look like to live into these new bylaws, and see if they might need to read be readjusted and further amended to carry us into the future we dream of. I'm so grateful to those of you who've already reached out to me or the board for conversation or with questions, concerns, reflections. More conversation and more curiosity is how we carry us through challenging moments. People's Church is based on the idea that we do not need to believe the same things to be connected to each other, to be community with each other. In a world that is always unraveling, this is one of the most important acts of reweaving that we do, one of the most important skills that we practice here. We talk about hard things, hurt things. And in that honesty and curiosity, we create moments, glimpses of the world we want to live in always. You, people's people, make all of this possible. Your flexibility, your willingness to tell your truth, your listening, your creativity, your curiosity, and your generosity with your time and your money. If this was three years ago, I would lay out now some detailed plans for the year ahead and ask you to fund them and tell you specifics about things. And I know that that is not true. It never was true, but I know it now in a new way. So I can't tell you for sure what will happen this year. I can tell you some plans that we have and we'll see what happens, but I know there's a group working to make peace in nature camp happen. For the first time in two years, this is our day camp for our children. Diane and I, as I mentioned earlier, have many ambitious plans for adult education. And we have just hired a church administrator, a new church administrator who will start soon. So Chris Luter, who has served us so well for so many years, will move on. And there'll be plans to celebrate him next month. So we're going to make him as much of a center of attention as he will permit us to make him, which is not very much. All of these people who don't like being publicly thanked for all of the wonderful things they do around here. And so as our new administrator gets up to speed, it will allow Barb Davis and Alan Hunt and Mary Carroll, the volunteers who have kept our financial lives in order, a well-deserved retirement from that role at least a significant step back. They have been such attentive stewards of our finances for so long. We've been trying to step back for so long and we can let them. I am confident in our team, our staff, our lay leaders, and the ministry and programs we will offer in the coming year and trust that they will meet the moment, whatever that moment is. And I know that this will be a year of greater financial uncertainty. For the past two years, the church has received federal payment protection program loans, which were forgiven, and they have made such a difference in our financial well-being. They largely made up for the lost income that we lost because we didn't have as many building rentals and we didn't have large fundraisers like the Holiday Bazaar. Um, there is no new... PPP loans in the future, as far as anybody can tell. And we still don't know what rentals or fundraisers will look like this year. So there's plans. We'll see. 
So the financial well-being of our church, as always, depends on your generous giving. And this is the Sunday where I invite you to continue to be the generous people that you are, that you have been, that have carried us so far. Your generosity with your time, your money, your technological skill, your patience as we figured out Zoom and everything else that we have done. Through the tech wizardry of one of our church members, you'll be receiving a text message this afternoon if, you, if we have your cell phone number on file with a, with a link to a personalized pledge form. Your name is already filled in. I don't even know how they do this, but it's amazing. You'll also, we have emails and other communications coming as well. And we also have paper pledge forms on the table right by the main entrance to the commons. So if you're in person and just wanna fill it out and never have to think about it for the next while, feel free. We're asking people if they're able to increase their pledges by 3% as we hope to increase staff salaries by that much. We increased them that by that much last year too. So we're trying to keep up with inflation and our everybody's good and important work. How much should I give? People ask. I invite you to give generously, and I know that is vague, we, but we all define generosity differently. Think about how much you value the congregation, how much you want to support its mission in the world. Think about your budget and what you can afford. I encourage you to choose an amount that feels significant, that gives you a sense of contribution and co-ownership, enough that makes you feel like you're really part of things. And find the sweet spot where you feel really generous and you're excited when you get to write that check or see that bank transfer, but not, but not an amount so high that you feel resentful or burdened. And I trust that you to know what that is for you. And some of you like more concrete numbers. So I will tell you that our average pledge last year was about $2,000. So if you're average, that's what you should give, but Nobody is average. And we also have plenty of people in the church with lower incomes who give five or $10 a month, and that is generous for them, and we are grateful. Once upon a time, several years ago, the UUA charged churches a fee per member as part of their membership structure, and that is no longer the case. So there's no sense that if you don't give enough, it doesn't count. We will take any amount that feels meaningful to you. I want you to feel good about your giving. We know that money and shame are this close network of not in many of our lives. And one of my hopes for this church is that we can freely and openly talk about money and the power it holds in our lives. Have that difficult conversation in healthy and productive ways as well. A dream of a church that can talk is frankly and honestly about money as our teachers are talking to children about sex right now. We're not there yet, but we're working on it. And I know that asking people to pledge now to start giving in July to carry through that fiscal year is just not how everybody's financial life works now, if it ever did. And so we encourage people to make pledges now because it makes our planning easier. We know that that's not everyone's story. And so you don't need to complete a pledge form to give to the church. We'll gladly accept money or stock or whatever it is you decide to give whenever you want to give it. It does help us to know that you're waiting and we'll give as you know what your income is. So please let us know. And we also know that circumstances change. Every year there are people who lose jobs or have things change and don't fulfill their pledges. Every year, there's people who get a, get a raise or have something come into their life that they weren't expecting and give more. It's good if you let us know, just so we don't let you know that you're doing it wrong or that we're expecting something from you. But there's a magic in it and that it most of the time evens out the people who can give more and the people who can't. Know that your generosity matters. Every pledge, every gift makes a difference. 
every strand in our weaving, every red thread of love or soft, deep blue of sensitivity and understanding or white heat of convictions or risky, fragile green of new growth or the golden flashes of gratitude. We weave those together, our time, our talent, our treasure and create something more beautiful for the difference. Being the people's church is both a theological claim and a practical reality. This is a church of the people, by the people, and for the people. And this church exists only because of generations who have built it, who have carried it to this moment, who have done the works of love together, which none of us can accomplish alone. And it will continue because each of us chooses to take on that mantle and carry it forward with what we have to offer. So may we be generous. May we continue to reweave time and time again. May it be so. May we make it so. And amen. Greetings, peoples, people, and good morning. I'm really sorry uh, that I can't be there today, but I wanted to record uh, uh, the song for you and uh, um, just wish uh, everyone well and uh, success with our stewardship campaign this year, which I'm sure is as important as it's ever been, uh, given all the things going on. And uh, so here is a song of hope for hope that our lives can be more normal soon and uh, that the world is a brighter place than it is at the moment. People of hope. It's hard to believe in the sun in the dark of the night and it's hard to believe in the stars in the bright morning light well we all need a place we can go to learn what is real to ponder the depths of the soul where truth is real Oh, this is our place, this is our home, working and seeking, we're never alone, in this mortar and stone, these windows and walls, love's earthly home, heeding the call, it's bread for the It's hard to believe there is peace when war rages on And it's hard to believe there is love in hate's raging throng But for every brave soldier a peacemaker takes her own stand and for every so long turned away, there waits a new hand. Oh, let it be you. Let it be me. Here in love's dwelling, we learn to believe in this mortar and stone. Love's earthly home, heeding the call. It's bread for the journey, oil for the flame. For people of love, people of hope, 
Sending you peaceful thoughts this morning. So if you remember one thing from this morning, it's probably the proposal that we just saw. Isn't that amazing? And if you remember two things, it's probably the music. But at some point on the list, I want us to go out into the world or return to our days, knowing that we are part of this thing, this precious community, and it is our commitments, our conversation, our curiosity, the care and love we bring to it that makes it the place that it is. So let us go in peace and go in love.